our fixed ideas about uh, ourselves, about others, and a central consequence of ego involvement is separateness, this per perceived separateness from others, from the world around us, and uh, we more easily recognize our differences than our similarities very often, and uh, we will even magnify and exaggerate those differences. And separateness fosters at least three kinds of uh, psychological and social ills. Uh, what um, journalist and author David Brooks calls a crisis. And the first is uh, loneliness. <clears throat> it's estimated that 35% of Americans over the age of 35 are chronically lonely. And uh, pastors, uh, religious leaders in Britain have reported that the most common issue that they have to address with their parishioners is loneliness. Uh, a former uh, U.S. Surgeon General, Vivek Murthy, wrote that during my years caring for patients, the most common pathology I saw was not heart disease or diabetes, it was loneliness. And we're learning that loneliness is not just uh, uh, bad for our mental health, it can even shorten our lifespans. A second kind of social ill is uh, distrust or alienation. And earlier generations of Americans implicitly or, or explicitly uh, had faith in a, a social compact. If you give, others will give back. And that compact now appears to be broken. These days now it's if you give, others will take. In the 1940s and 1950s in the US, about 60% of Americans said that they trusted their neighbors. And now these days, 68% of Americans report distrusting their neighbors. That, arise, that rises to 82% of millennials. A third kind of social ill is outright hatred. So since <clears throat> up until about uh, 2017, an FBI report uh, indicated that there's been a 23% increase in religion-based hate crimes in the US. So <clears throat> what this means is we need an antidote. Now it would be nice if we could just buy that off the shelf but instead we have to rely upon ourselves. And I wanna suggest three uh, interrelated uh, psychological processes that I think may be very helpful in attenuating ego involvement or becoming, as we have put it, and using kind of a clunky term, hypoegoic. The first is awareness, the capacity to know what we're thinking, what we're feeling, what we're experiencing kinesthetically, how we're behaving. A second uh, that, that leads from that awareness is uh, disidentification, or sometimes what's called dif diffusion. The ability to kind of step out of our thought patterns, of our uh, emotional states, to observe them, if you like, to introduce a, a, a gap so that uh, we are less bound up in what it is that we think, what it is that we feel. And out of that disidentification can come a reduced reactivity. So if we have, if we in a sense kind of acknowledge that I am not my thoughts, I am not my emotions because I can be aware of them, then we're less likely to be reactive when strong thoughts or strong emotions arise. And one <clears throat> phenomenon that, um, that characterizes this kind of diffusion or, or uh, disidentification is uh, something called mindfulness. And I'll just define that very simply here. It's a sustained receptive attention to and awareness of moment to moment experience. That's a very a deceptively simple uh, way of putting it. Be happy to un unpack that more uh, in the Q and A. Um, but, uh, what we have learned about mindfulness over the past 20 years or so is quite a bit. And one of the things we've learned is that 
it does seem to be a distinct process from this uh, self-relevant, kind of very uh, self-involved processing that we are uh, uh, often uh, caught up in. So um, self-relevant processing is often associated with parts of the brain that are called the default mode network. Default being they're, they're kind of our, our, uh, a common condition that we're wrapped up in. Whereas mindful processing seems to involve um, parts of the brain that have to do with executive functioning, with this capacity, as I said, to kind of regulate what we're experiencing. And <clears throat> if this is true, if mindfulness does indeed foster a kind of disengagement from uh, self-centered concerns, then it may also enhance the perceived similarity and, and connectedness with other people and uh, thereby enhance relatedness. Uh, Zen teacher Thich Nhat Hanh puts it, I think, very succinctly, the most precious gift we can offer others is our presence. So what's the evidence for this? Well, I'm gonna present a sampling of work that's, uh, that we've been uh, involved in for the past several years. And uh, this work kind of whoops, stretches across three different domains in which we've looked at the role of mindfulness in fostering uh, social engagement in cyberspace, in a laboratory context, and in in vivo or day-to-day or -day life contexts. So, um, we, I'm gonna present these uh, three kind of uh, uh, types of work that we've been involved in that uh, we're framing as relational challenges. And the reason I do so is because, you know, when we think of what uh, mindfulness is, it's often uh, construed as a, a inner directed kind of work. You know, we're learning to pay attention to our internal processes. So how can this possibly uh, uh, have something to say about how we relate to other people. So it's a challenge that we uh, sought to, to address. And the first way in which I'm gonna present this is does it actually in increase the, the, uh, uh, the quantity of relationship that people have? What does it say about people's uh, levels of loneliness? And this is a study that uh, is a randomized trial study that used a smartphone-based mindfulness training. So people were randomized into three different conditions, a, uh, one of two kinds of mindfulness training, one that involved uh, just cultivating the sense of attention to uh, in, internal experience, another that involved uh, that monitoring training plus a receptivity, a training in receptivity or allowing of experience to unfold. And a third being a control training that involved uh, largely reappraisal. And this was a two week long intervention in which people did um, training sessions about 15, 20 minutes per day over those 14 days, and did ecological momentary assessment for three days before the training and three days at the end of the training. And I'm gonna cut right to the chase here because I know this is the last day of the conference and your, <laughs> your cognitive load might be quite high. So um, this is what we found. <clears throat> when it came to social interactions, those who received this training in uh, uh, non-judgmental or, or receptive attention showed an increase, a significant increase in social interactions from pre to post training uh, with no change amongst those who receive the attention only or monitoring only training and those who receive the coping control training. There was also a significant decline in perceived uh, loneliness uh, from pre to post training amongst these people who, re who received uh, the uh, mindful uh, receptive uh, attention or, or non-judgmental mindfulness training relative to the two control conditions. But we wanted to uh, push the envelope on this with a second relational challenge by asking, can something like mindfulness not only increase the degree to which people are relating to each other, uh, can they also 
reach out to others in a pro-social kind of manner. So if mindfulness really cultivates this sense of uh, really knowing oneself well, does that encourage a capacity to feel what other people feel, for example, when they're in distress? And so this second um, study that I'm gonna present, which is really kind of a gloss of now uh, about half a dozen studies with over 500 participants, was designed to address that question. Can mindfulness training increase pro-sociality? And um, in this uh, series of studies, people received brief mindfulness instruction. So they just did 10 minutes of, of uh, guided, uh, mindfulness meditation in a laboratory context, uh, whereas other folks uh, were randomized to receive relaxation training or to receive no instruction. And um, how this was set up was such that people were presented with a scenario in which someone was apparently victimized in a, a cyberspace context. And the way that we uh, set this up was uh, through the use of the game, it sounds like some people know this task uh, called Cyberball, in which uh, three ostensible players were um, uh, playing this game, in which the participant was simply observing one of the players be excluded from the game after a, a short series of trials. So let's say, you know, for sake of argument that uh, myself and Rich and Ed are, are playing, and at some point, Rich gets excluded from the game. <clears throat> Not that I would ever do that, but <laughs> for purposes of illustration. So the participant is simply observing this after they receive training or, or, uh, or no training. And then they're asked, okay, what would you like to say to these folks uh, who you just observed playing the game? So they were set up with real email accounts and uh, say and told you know say write something to the players, and we're of course we're particularly interested in what they wrote to the the player who was victimized, who was excluded or ostracized from the game, and uh, uh, they then observed they then uh, participated in the game. They were given an opportunity to now join the game, and the question was how do they behave with the excluded player. How do, how do they uh, uh, involve this player or not in the ball tossing game? And uh, what we saw was that uh, people who are blind to the uh, conditions of the participants rated the, uh, or scored the content of the emails. And what uh, we found was that those who received this um, mindfulness training showed significantly higher levels of um, comfort related words in their emails relative to those who were in the uh, relaxation control condition and the no instruction condition. We also saw that when they were uh, given opportunity to join the game, the proportion of uh, throws that they uh, sent to the excluded player was significantly higher than those who uh, were in the other conditions. And this is after controlling for, um, uh, for uh, state levels of anger toward the perpetrator and a, a number of other personality characteristics, et cetera. And what we also asked them to do was to uh, give their sense of how, in, how much they felt empathic toward the excluded player in all three conditions. And what we saw was that those in the mindfulness condition expressed more empathic concern for the uh, victimized person. And that empathic concern uh, explained the relation between the mindfulness training and the pro-social emails that they sent to the excluded player. It also explained the uh, pro-social action that they exhibited in the ball tossing game when they had opportunity to join it. So what we see here is that mindfulness seems to conduce to um, a felt sense of what other people are, are feeling, uh, and that then leads to pro-social action. So 
to push the envelope even further, we wanted to see, okay, can mindfulness uh, encourage this sense of empathy, this sense of pro-social behavior, when they're put into position of, of having to if, like bridge a social divide. So we, uh, as you uh, may know, we are often much more likely to share psychological and tangible resources with people who are members of our in-group, defined in various ways, than members of out-groups, social out-groups. So what we were interested in is, can mindfulness help to bridge that, sometimes what's called that empathy gap uh, between in-group and out-group members? So this was a, a, a third kind of design that we, um, that we uh, did, and it was based on some initial work that we saw showing that uh, when people completed a self-report measure of mindfulness using a, 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 what we call the Mindful Attention Awareness Scale, that those who scored high were more likely to help a member of an an opposite race, in this case they were all white participants having opportunity to help a uh, African American uh, confederate, what they thought was another participant. And that was particularly true when their levels of self-reported racialness were high. In other words, mindfulness seemed to attenuate the, uh, the, the uh, tendency of those who are high in racial prejudice to not be helpful. And in fact, the difference between them was uh, about 40% of those who were low in mindfulness helping when, when they were high in racial prejudice, and about 80 to 85% of those who were helping amongst people who were high in mindfulness, and even when they were high in racial prejudice. So that gave us some basis to proceed with a, uh, an experiment in which we did uh, here a third kind of mindfulness training, this time in-person training, in which groups of people were brought together for uh, four consecutive days and spent an hour working with a mindfulness facilitator. Uh, and uh, relative to participants in the other condition who received um, a, uh, a control kind of relaxation training. So with about 80 folks in these studies, they uh, were presented with two different scenarios in which they had opportunity to help. One in which a Confederate did the kind of classic, you know, tripped in spilled a bunch of papers on the floor, and the question was, would the participant help the person? And this, in this case, was a, an African-American Confederate. And uh, in the other scenario, the Confederate came in on crutches and leaned against the wall, exhibited an audible sigh of discomfort, and the question was, would the participant give up their chair for the uh, apparent other participant? So what we saw was before the training, <clears throat> no difference between the two conditions. Those who were, got the mindfulness training, what they thought was mindfulness training, what we call sham training, but was really a relaxation training. No differences there, but at post-intervention, uh, what we saw was a, a change from about 50% of participants helping beforehand to about 80% of participants helping after the training. And this is after controlling for a number of uh, situational and uh, psychological features. So what does this say about uh, mindfulness and uh, social behavior? When I, I wanna suggest a couple of things, one is, uh, much of the work that's been done in SDT has been based on social uh, forces, social contextual factors that can help to support relatedness. And I think what, what we're uh, probing here is an internal resource that can uh, encourage that sense of relatedness. And what's really, what's really interesting to me is that these training programs that people received were really quite brief. 
uh, you know, four days of, uh, of practice or two weeks of uh, 20 minutes a day, even 10 minutes in a laboratory context can produce this kind of expression of relatedness. So what it suggest, suggested to me was that, you know, for many of us, that the, this ego involvement may be a relatively thin veil, if you like, that can be lifted with, uh, with uh, comparatively little effort, uh, if we're willing to make that. I'll just give you a brief sense of what is next for us in this still quite young line of work. Uh, we're continuing to do work looking at how mindfulness can en encourage pro-social behavior across uh, racial categories. We're also um, going to move into the domain of political divides in which we'll be asking whether um, <clears throat> people who self-identify as more liberally political are uh, willing to engage with uh, someone who is um, presented as being more conservatively oriented politically, which in the US is uh, a, pretty, uh, a, a pretty sharp divide right now. But I think uh, the importance of this lies in the fact that, uh, you know, what we're, we're facing these days are global problems that really people need to pull together for in order to solve. So what we're really asking is, uh, can people who, who learn this capacity to be present, to be mindful, uh, can that facilitate this breakdown of, of social divides that uh, may be very helpful in um, helping us collectively deal with the problems that we're facing? So I just wanna end by suggesting that, um, that we're, we're much more similar than we are different. We're really made up of the same stuff and not just biologically. There's probably no experience that we have that is not shared. And we can know that intellectually, but the challenge I think to, to know it is to know it in one's bones so that it can be lived on a daily basis. And uh, the work that we're doing suggests that mindfulness may be able to meet that challenge. So that's where I will end and uh, thank you for your attention.